Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, to the seminar on um, uh, NMR in pursuit of science. Our, it's a pleasure here to have Professor Chandra Kumar as a speaker today. Professor Chandra Kumar is a INSA senior scientist and professor emeritus uh, with the Department of Chemistry uh, at IIT Madras. Previously, he headed the Physical Science Division in uh, CSIR CLNI and Chair Professorship at IIT Madras. He has been awarded the CSIR Young Scientist Award, Patnagar Prize, JC Bose uh, National Fellowship and Indian Science Congress Millennium Medal. So Professor Chandrakumar, it's really a pleasure to have you here. And uh, as a small story, uh, I met Professor Chandrakumar, um, of course I have been, I suppose, those of us who have uh, studied NMR spectroscopy, he has a uh, uh, couple of uh, very influential books and uh, so I was familiar with his work. And I had the pleasure of meeting him in uh, Aisa Bedampur. And uh, I think uh, then when we were getting into the cab, we discussed that, all right, I mean, we, are, we, we have a spectroscopy group here, and it would be wonderful if uh, Professor Chandra Kumar could visit us. And uh, uh, fortunately, he could. So it's wonderful to have him here, and the uh, stage is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much once again uh, for giving me this opportunity to visit you all at Korea and Kalyan in particular. Uh, thanks for your friendly hospitality to the entire group. I'm sorry, I don't wish to appear rude, but unfortunately I stumbled this morning somewhere and sprained my foot. So please bear with me. I will sit down and deliver this talk, okay? And thanks also to all the guys who propped, up, propped me up with some painkillers and things of that kind, sprays and so on. Thanks. All right. Um, so we are going to give an overview of what can be done with NMR in the pursuit of science this afternoon. And uh, as a subtitle, I have put down a, a rephrased version of what is supposed to have been Bill Clinton's campaign manager's slogan in the 90s, when he is reputed to have said, it is the economy, stupid. So here for NMR, we would say, it's a resolution or contrast versus sensitivity. That's the name of the game. And the general introduction I would give for the, uh, without plunging directly into NMR, is to mention that uh, this famous tree of knowledge of the sciences that I have adapted from uh, the late Richard Ernst's work, Nobel laureate R.R. R. Ernst, Nobel laureate in chemistry, 1991. Uh, he used to flash a slide which I have uh, very significantly modified, uh, but the main parts are the spin resonance is a ladder to the tree of knowledge comprising three levels of physics, chemistry, and biology. And I then put up all the rest of it, the subsoil and uh, all those stuff there, okay? The medicine and the materials and the energy and the information. And uh, of, to all of this, spin resonance spectroscopy turns out to be a ladder which can reach you to any level of this knowledge of uh, tree of knowledge, <laughs> not knowledge of tree, but tree of knowledge, okay? So, uh, thanks to Professor Hans, uh, you know, he just passed away uh, in 2021, mid-2021. Uh, the preeminent NMR person of the last 50 plus years, okay? Undoubtedly, I think I can be allowed to say that, okay? And uh, great Indophile. Great friend of India, has visited India and lectured in India many times, visited my laboratory as well, and so on, okay? So it's a deep sense of personal loss also that I can briefly express here as a revered, uh, but a personal friend. Such a fine gentleman, not only a Nobel caliber scientist, which showed in his chemistry prize of 1991, but a very fine and humble gentleman, okay? Um, now, chemistry, we like to think of it as a central science as it's indicated in the tree of knowledge as well. Because you see that chemistry is figuring somewhere in the middle of that tree. Uh, the subsoil is intuition, logic, and mathematics. And Richard Ernst's slide starts with the physics. And then the central part is the chemistry and then comes the biology. And I top it off with all the rest of this here, uh, with medicine and materials and information and energy. And the important feature of Richard Ernst's slide is of course he was plugging hard for spin resonance of which NMR is one facet, 
okay? And this is a ladder to climb at any level and pluck any fruit or leaf or what you will from the tree of knowledge of science. That was Richard Arndt's message. So in the general intro, I'll just uh, talk about chemistry as the central science, which was indicated in that slide, okay? Uh, you know that uh, things like water, the elixir of life, food, nutrients, uh, proteins, carbohydrates, fats, DNA or RNA, drugs and pharmaceuticals, clothing, housing, anything impacting the life of living beings and above all humans, okay? Because you may say that all living beings do not necessarily care for clothing or housing, but humans do. And uh, nowadays I find that a lot of humans are clothing and housing their pets as well, even if we cannot house all of us satisfactorily in the human race. But anyway, a lot of this, uh, key to this, a lot of this is hydrogen bonding. And the role of hydrogen bonds in water structure, in the uh, double helical structure of DNA, the triple helical structure of collagen and all of that. Stereochemistry, handedness in sugars, which is D sugars. It is L amino acids, and then not the other way around. Okay, and as, as a backdrop against that, you just see what can go wrong. What can go wrong if the stereochemistry is not obeyed, if the handedness is not obeyed? This was the thalidomide tragedy in the 50s of the last century. And uh, this is the molecule we are talking about, and it has two uh, forms, okay? Stereo. Uh, 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 st it was touted as a drug for morning sickness, and it turned out that the young mothers who took this medicine during the prenatal period of the babies, when they were carrying the babies, they, they gave birth to babies who were hugely and uh, deformed. Okay? Such a tragic occurrence. And this was traced to the fact that the R form and the S form behave completely differently and uh, the wrong form is teratogenic, giving rise to those monstrosities in the embryo as it was even right at the delivery stage, okay? Unfortunately, there is an interconversion under the uh, living conditions of the R form to the S form back and forth. So there's no real way that you can avoid this, even if you manage to do a pure synthesis. And chiral synthesis actually, actually is probably originated later. But thalidomide has been taken off permanently as far as morning sickness start of stuff is concerned. It is nowadays used for uh, other innocuous conditions. I mean, where you don't associate any birth issues with that. Uh, suddenly, the pointer refuses to advance. What can I do about it? And the switch on yeah. switch on, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, uh, the whole business of chiral synthesis has uh, taken off with uh, increasing awareness of uh, the problems associated with the wrong handedness <laughs> or none, okay? And uh, now this particular drug is used for the treatment of inflammation. Uh, associated with leprosy and whatever, okay? So, now, the question is, how do you know all this? You don't see the molecules, the old story goes that went off and Labelle and so on, they could pick off crystals of tartaric acid of either handedness because the physical morphology of those crystals let them visually take the cue and pick it off. But then came all these physical methods, okay? And one of those physical methods is the topic today that we are talking about. But I should also mention that how do we model these molecular systems? Because today, uh, science, much of it uh, is about molecules. People even talk about molecular machines for the future, molecule gear gears, and so on and so forth, okay? And not to speak of just the chemistry proper or the biochemistry and the medicine and so on, all of which is closely related to molecules. So you can say the modern paradigm of science is in fact, by and large, na uh, molecular science, okay? 
molecular science. And uh, uh, to model molecular systems, one uses a variety of techniques uh, going back to quantum chemistry, the Schrodinger equation, uh, semi-empirical methods, ab initio methods, the density functional theory, couple of cluster methods as the uh, most uh, advance of those techniques and molecular mechanics and molecular dynamics for modeling. So those are the various methods of molecular systems being modeled. Okay? And then we know with all these approaches we have come to the understanding that electrons and spins play the vital role in chemistry. Chemistry is controlled by electrons. Yes, the nuclei provide the molecular skeleton or the scaffolding, but Actual chemistry is about electrons going back and forth, transferring one way or the other, reducing reactions, oxidation reactions, and so on. So electrons and the spins of the electrons are central in chemistry. And the chemistry uh, uh, is uh, the behavior of uh, bodies, uh, I mean, uh, assemblies of electrons is controlled by the antisymmetry principle, which is a descriptor of the state or the wave function at its most elementary level. It's a descriptor of a pair of spin half particles, such as electrons. And this needs to be antisymmetric, the state of a pair of fermions or electrons in our case needs to be antisymmetric with respect to the permutation of two particles. That is, the wave function changes sign on interchanging the electron labels. As a consequence, you have the Pauli exclusion principle, which is in popular parlance put down as saying that no two electrons can occupy the same orbital unless they have opposite spin components. Okay? So two electrons can occupy the same state or the same orbital if and only if they have opposite spin. And therefore, you arrive at the model of the chemical bond as basically an electron pair bond. Meanwhile, much water has flown down that bridge. You talk about bond orders of uh, fractional uh, numbers, you know, half, one and a half, and so on and so forth. But the prime, not to speak of double and triple bonds, of course, but the primary currency of bonding is a basic thing. Building block is a single bond, and the electron pairs are involved there. Okay? the electron pair bond and that is a standard if you may call it that basic chemical bond and uh, the two electrons which are associated with that bonding molecular orbital have opposite spin as a consequence of the anti-symmetric uh, re anti-symmetrization requirement of the wave function of uh, two particle states okay and how do we determine all this so you model all this by quantum chemistry and various methods related to it, whether ab initio or semi-empirical or density functional or molecular modeling of one kind or the other, molecular dynamics included. But how do you determine this? And that is by spectroscopic methods, by diffractometric methods, or things like scanning probe microscopes. And now today I'll be talking about one arm of spectroscopy, and that is nuclear magnetic resonance. I'll just put a little intro to that by pointing out that the measurement of eigenvalues of uh, eigenvalue differences of energy eigenstates, that is what is going on in these uh, uh, characterization methods. In spectroscopy, when you talk about ionization potential or electron affinity, you're like talking about energy eigenvalues in some sense. But when you're talking about the stern gerlach experiment, there again you're talking about a spin eigenvalue in a direction of a magnetic field. When you're talking about spectroscopic experiments, on the other hand, you're measuring energy level differences. Differences in the energy of pairs of energy eigenvalues across those eigenstates is where your transition is occurring. So that's what we are talking about. Transitions between pairs of energy levels subject to certain selection rules, as it's called. Okay, but we therefore measure in spectroscopic e experiments typically, unlike ionization potentials, electron affinities, or the Stern-Gerlach experiment, in spectroscopic experiments we measure not directly eigenvalues, but eigenvalue differences. Okay, now magnetic resonance spectroscopy and imaging, we're converging on the topic of the day, and uh, of, so you might say this is a very humble sounding thing, just measure eigenvalues of energy eigenstates, or eigenvalue differences between pairs of energy eigenstates, this is very humble, you might call it at one end of the uh, spectrum of thinking, and on the other end of the world view you might say, oh, this is sounding very esoteric, okay, one way or the other, of such either humble or esoteric origins of nuclear spin. Now you're talking about nuclear spins, not electron spins. In chemistry, it's all about electron spins. But we are going to use magnetic resonance and nuclear spins as probes 
of molecules, molecular dynamics, molecular transport, molecular, I mean, imaging, and all of that. And the nuclei play a fantastic role as almost a close to ideal measurement technique. You know, in quantum mechanics, when you're talking about measurements and microscopic systems, you're confronted day in and day out with what is related to the uncertainty principle first formulated officially by Heisenberg. So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. What it says is that you try to measure some characteristic of a small object, like an electron or a little molecule or an atom or what have you, and you're likely to disturb the state of the system which you're trying to measure. And an ideal measurement, won't, you wouldn't like a good measurement to do that. What's the point in disturbing the very property that you're measuring, okay? Now, you can stick a thermometer in a bath of water and you can be pretty confident you perturb nothing because the heat capacity of the bath of water is ever so much higher than the heat capacity of the thermometer, be it an alcohol or a mercury or whatever other thermometer you have. And that's exactly the point. You're talking about tiny systems and even with tiny measurement sensors, you're going to disturb the state of the system as a rule except when you are dealing with special states, and that's what eigenstates are, okay? Energy eigenstates, for example, okay? So it's not, nothing mysterious, you know? It's just a very intuitive, uh, intuitively accessible, uh, accessible kind of argument, okay? But uh, measurements in magnetic, so you say that in quantum mechanics, when you want to measure a property of a system, this is going to be a projective measurement. Not so in magnetic resonance. So the measurement itself is going to tend, have a tendency, a strong tendency to change the state of the system that you're measuring, okay? But not so in magnetic resonance. In magnetic resonance, your measurement is a, what you may call this a weak projective measurement. So it's as near as one can conceive to an ideal measurement. Although you're still doing it on a microscopic particle, on a nuclear spin. Nothing smaller than that that I can think of. Of course, you're not dealing with one individual nuclear spin, you're dealing with whole ensembles of bucket full of nuclear spins, but nevertheless, the fundamental entity that you're measuring is a nothing tinier than this, okay? Except for the zoo of elementary particles, the tiniest is the nucleus. And that is what you're measuring without disturbing it. So it's a very nearly ideal measurement, and that's one of the fun things about magnetic resonance and NMR in particular. You are making a near ideal measurement, what you may, in other words, call as a weak projective measurement. Now, now this is a very interesting field, NMR. You can view it as of humble origin or esoteric origin, as I mentioned, but then it is applicable even to clinical practice by way of MRI, it can also be used for mundane issues like finding the provenance of wine, which you may call as mundane, but wine is supposed to lead you to other uh, realms, okay, of existence, which is why you're interested in wine. And you can find the provenance of wine by looking at the deuterium isotope composition, which shows up in your sugars or whatever wine that you're analyzing, because that reflects the soil composition. Soils in certain parts of France will have a different deuterium composition as compared to soils in certain parts of, it parts of Italy, for example. And I'm sure Hyderabad will be completely a different story yet again. So you can use NMR even for uh, finding out the provenance of wines. And more lately, of course, we've all been seeing these uh, uh, television ads which are constantly running where two companies are fighting each other about the quality of their honey. So you can certainly use, and they're swearing, although they're showing some other instrument altogether, they're swearing by NMR measurements. What they show is not an NMR machine. Okay, it's more like a microscope it looks like. Okay, but it's an NMR measurement they're swearing by. So you can use NMR for all sorts of things, for clinical work, for uh, this kind of uh, molecular assay, if you like, uh, for uh, deuterium in wine, or of uh, whatever additive, additive fructose sugars or syrups in honey, and so on. And in the natural sciences, in the engineering sciences, and in the medical sciences, NMR and MRI, nuclear magnetic resonance and magnetic resonance imaging, may be flexibly adapted to investigate molecular structure, molecular dynamics, molecular distribution, and molecular transport. I'll just try to give in the time available a quick uh, run over these, giving a flavor of the stuff that is possible with this kind of thing. So in spectroscopy, of course, you have this wide ranging electromagnetic spectrum, taking you all the way from gamma rays, you know, 
to X-rays and UV visible and infrared and uh, microwave and NMR, uh, radio waves. And NMR is right at the red end of that spectrum, as it were, okay? It's at the long wavelength, like a one meter wavelength, typically, order of magnitude. That's where you measure NMR. So it doesn't break bonds. UV visible, you might end up decomposing the molecule if you're going to UV. There's no such uh, hazard here. So it's a really non-destructive and uh, uh, non-invasive if you don't use a solvent. Okay, but non-destructive certainly. It doesn't destroy what it is measuring. Doesn't even change the state of the system you're measuring, leave alone destroying it, okay? And uh, what we are doing here is uh, radio frequency spectroscopy traditionally, but NMR is for a variety of reasons being done at ever higher fields with the passing years, and then you're slowly treading into the microwave region of the electromagnetic spectrum. So you might call it as a radio frequency and microwave spectroscopy overall. And, uh, okay, we will not worry about this history that uh, resonance came up from the stern gerlach experiment by the modification introduced by Rabbi, who was the first to show that uh, radio waves whose frequencies match the precession frequency of nuclei can cause spins to flip in that direction or in that orientation in an external magnetic field. Flip from one stable state to another, one eigenstate to another, in a spin half there are only two eigenstates, okay? So, resonance in bulk matter for electron spins was Zawoyski's handiwork in 1945. Around the same time, end of 1945, early 1946, two independent groups came up with NMR, uh, Purcell on, I think, the east coast of the United States and Felix Bloch on the west coast. And then Damilton Kruger, after several years, came up with nuclear quadrupole resonance. Electrons are spin half particles, and the NMR, which was first known, uh, was also for spin halves like protons, but subsequently it is expanded to cover almost every magnetic isotope in the periodic table. And nuclear quadrupole and these techniques of ESR or NMR require external magnetic fields to be applied. There is a special branch called the zero field NMR or zero field ESR, but the typical ESR or NMR experiment is conducted in the presence of an external magnetic field. And there is this sister technique of nuclear quadrupole resonance, which, don't, which doesn't need a, a magnetic field. And this is for uh, spin one and higher spin nuclei in the solid state. These techniques of ESR and NMR are in principle applicable to liquid or solid or gas phase. By and large, they would be carried out predominantly in the liquid state and solution state, uh, but also in the solid state for NMR. For EPR, it doesn't matter. Gas phase is possible, but normally to low in sensitivity. Damilton Kruger's NQR of spin greater than half nuclei is only possible in the solid state, not in liquid or gas phase. Okay? And uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, I'll just move with this, I'll forget the rest of it, electron paramagnetic resonance and quadrupole resonance of nuclear. And we're saying the major application uh, areas are elucidation of molecular structure, as I already mentioned, also molecular dynamics, distribution and transport. So it gets a huge uh, leg up for structural biology and for materials uh, work and biomedicine and imaging, okay? So that's the field over which are the domain of NMR and MRI, okay? Uh, the principles are that you have a bunch of nuclei in a sample, like you have a, a small drop of water and you have a very large number of water molecules there. Each water molecule has two pro hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Of course, as every chemist, uh, chemist knows in the molecular structure of uh, H2O, but then each hydrogen atom has a nucleus there and it is the magnetic moment of the nucleus that we are talking about in NMR, okay? And oriented randomly in the absence of a magnetic field. They are oriented every which way so that the average magnetic moment of the whole bunch of nuclei is going to be zero. Okay? But when you apply a magnetic field, they line up. They line up either parallel or anti-parallel. These are the only two allowed orientations for so-called spin half particle, like the proton nucleus, also carbon-13, also fluorine-19, phosphorus-31, nitrogen-15, many other nuclei. About 30-odd nuclei in the periodic table have spin half. Three nuclei have spin one. About 30 odd nuclei have spin three halves. None have spin two. But there is lutetium, which one of my friends, young friends, was mentioning the other day as of interest to him, spin seven. Okay? So you have uh, this whole zoo of uh, nuclear isotopes. Okay? And you can deal with every one of them. 
And the important thing is the magnetic field aligns them and for protons or C13 or fluorine or phosphorus or N15, they're just aligned parallel to the field, some of them, and a fewer number are aligned per anti-parallel to the field because that has higher energy associated with it. And that is what is shown in this figure that the uh, spins of uh, arbitrary orientation in the absence of a magnetic field, B0 is zero, uh, they are all uh, taking any possible orientation. But then when you impose a field, they line up either parallel to the field with the lower energy, this is the more stable state, or they sit in the higher energy state, anti-parallel to the field. These are the only two possibilities for these simple spin half nuclei, okay? And uh, you can't measure it. Unlike a paramagnetic electron system, like a transition metal complex or something, where if there are unpaired electrons, you can measure it on a GUI balance, or GUI balance, whichever way you prefer to pronounce it, and you can measure the static susceptibility of a bunch of electrons. Because the magnetic moment of the electron is fairly large as compared to nuclei. The proton magnetic moment has the opposite sign as compared to the electron, but more important, from our point of view, the magnitude of the proton magnetic moment is 658 times smaller than that of the electron. So while the electron magnetic moment can be directly measured in a guy balance experiment or a Faraday balance experiment, you cannot do that with nuclei. The susceptibility of the nuclear spins, the paramagnetic susceptibility of the nuclear spins is like half a million times smaller. You can't measure this. People tried and failed. People first did that, tried and failed. And then they hit upon this rabbi idea of the change of the Shangri-La experiment by introducing resonance, and then the whole story begins, okay? So you have these nuclei lined up in these two energy levels. You cannot directly measure the difference uh, in the uh, population of the two levels, which gives rise to a net magnetization of the sample. The sample is still diamagnetic, and I have to keep uh, so emphasizing this to my medical friends, because a lot of medical people immediately get the idea, oh, I'm making an MRI image. This means my cell is paramagnetic. Except for deoxyhemoglobin, I'm not aware of anything which is really stably paramagnetic in the human organism or in most biological organisms. Water most certainly is not paramagnetic. It is diamagnetic. What you're doing here is, when you say a material is paramagnetic or diamagnetic, you're talking about the electronic paramagnetism or the electronic diamagnetism, and that's what counts. Because the electron magnetic moment is a magnitude 658 times the next nearest one, which is a proton nucleus, and much, much larger than other isotopes. So when you talk about diamagnetism or paramagnetism, you're talking about the electrons. What are we doing here in NMR? We are giving the go-by to the electrons. We are not worrying about the electrons. They will get their own back in some other way, as we will see. But what you are trying to measure is a nuclear paramagnetism, which is like searching for a needle in the haystack. And what do you do? You realize that the precession frequency is proportional to the magnetogyric ratio. And magnetogyric ratio, in turn, is proportional to the magnetic moment. And because the magnetogyric ratio and the magnetic moment of the electron are much larger in magnitude than that of any nucleus, the precession frequency of an electron is much larger than of any nucleus. So a nucleus in an external magnetic field, like in a Stranger experiment, you need a magnetic field now. It is not a zero field experiment. You can do some tricky zero field experiments, we will not talk about those. But the primary measurement technique in NMR or ESR is use a magnetic field, the so-called Zeeman field. And then, you know, you have this issue of um, the susceptibility by lining up the spins one way or the other, and the susceptibility being measurably strong in the case of unpaired electrons, like in transition metal complexes, but being immeasurably weak in the case of nuclear spins. So water molecule, if you talk about MRI, the radiological images that every radiologist is so fond of, where the contrast is the darling of radiologists. The MRI contrast is the darling of radiologists. And that's what I said right in the beginning. It is the resolution or contrast versus sensitivity, so and so, right? So the darling of MRI radiologists is the contrast, okay? And this is now, uh, what we are saying is we have really 
picked out a needle in the haystack and this contrast is emerging from the fact that although the electron diamagnetism of water swamps the nuclear paramagnetism by three orders of magnitude, you are deliberately picking out the three orders of magnitude weaker nuclear magnetism by allowing the precession because the precession frequency which is among the most precisely measured quantities in physical sciences, the time or the frequency, okay? And that is different by three orders of magnitude for nuclei as compared to electrons. And that is eminently detectable, no matter the electrons sitting around. And that is the trick of the resonance experiment, which makes the career for generations of Nobel laureates no less than uh, uh, humble people like me, and yours included, as it were, huh? yours truly, and so on, okay? So, uh, that's what it is. The water molecule has not become suddenly paramagnetic. No. It remains diamagnetic, true to its color, but you're picking the much weaker, three orders of magnitude, weaker nuclear paramagnetism, you are amplifying it by a million fold under resonance conditions, very transiently, and measuring it because of the difference in the precession frequency. That's the name of the game. And here is this picture of a, a, a spin with its spin angular momentum, a nucleus with its spin angular momentum. When it sees a magnetic field, the axis of the spin angular momentum and the axis of the particle processes around, and these equations capture the energy, the statics of the spin in the Zeeman field, the dynamics of the spin magnetic moment, the magnetic field, and then the precession frequency which emerges of that discussion. And so the spin precession is what we measure in NMR, and that can be pictured in this way at the t tiny magnetic moments, uh, the excess line up parallel to the magnetic field. As compared to the population in the anti-parallel orientation, there is an excess population of the spins in the parallel to the magnetic field orientation, and that gives rise to a magnetic moment of the sample which is still very, very much smaller than the electron diamagnetic susceptibility. Okay, now comes the trick of resonance, okay? And the trick of resonance is you have this magnetization along the magnetic field, and in our field, the magnetic field is always taken to be along the Z direction. So you say Z magnetization, you, that's the equilibrium condition, Boltzmann equilibrium, where the population distribution is governed by the Boltzmann law, then you create a non-equilibrium state. You cannot observe nuclear magnetic resonance until you first disturb the magnetic equilibrium. Mind you, we are not disturbing the chemical equilibrium of our molecules. We are not touching it. The chemical equilibrium remains unfazed. We are only looking at the equilibrium conditions of the magnetic degree of freedom of the spin magnetic moment in the Zeeman magnetic field. Okay? And unless you disturb that, you will not detect a thing in NMR. So the first job is starting from your equilibrium state of Z magnetization aligned with the external magnetic field along Z, you create a non-equilibrium state which is like an XY magnetization in a plane perpendicular to the magnetic field direction. And you have a coil there which can detect this, is much like a cycle dynamo where a, a, a moving coil in a magnetic field produces an EMF, okay? Or a moving magnetic field, when it cuts, when its flux cuts a stationary coil, will produce an EMF. And that is the principle of NMR detection, okay? So that's what it is, and the spectrometer hardware looks like this. Uh, I'm afraid I won't have the time to go into any of these details, but it is fantastic uh, electrical and electronic engineering here, as well as the software control of the entire system. You have the source of radiation, and then this is gated or pulsed. This is a microwave source in the case of ESR, and it is gated or pulsed, okay? And there's a pulse former, and then you have a pulse amplifier and so on, and uh, you put everything into the sample which is residing in the probe head or the resonator or the cavity. Depending on radio frequencies or microwaves, you have different names for these structures, which is sitting in the external magnetic field. So the pulse of the magnetic field and the cavity or the probe head or the resonator is sitting there, the sample is sitting inside this probe head, and the energy from the microwave source comes through a pulse former as a pulse of radiation and it gets in there and whatever response comes out is then detected with a reference wave from the same source 
which excited the spins. Okay? And then, of course, you digitize everything and you deal with everything else with a, a computer, the processing and so on and so forth. So that's the overall block diagram of any modern magnetic resonance spectrometer or imaging machine for that matter. Nuclear magnetic resonance as well as electron spin resonance. I'm sorry for the hardware uh, aficionados here. That's all I will have to say about the hardware in this talk. Okay? Now, uh, the effect of a pulse of resonant radiation is that the nuclear magnetization, which is lined up along the magnetic field Z, is going to be brought into the XY plane, okay? And that's where it cuts the coil, the flux of processing magnetization will cut the coil, okay? And it produces an EMF that becomes measurable. There is a million-fold amplification, effectively, of the magnetic field, uh, magnetic moment, the static magnetic moment is like amplified a million fold here in this resonance experiment. And that is what makes NMR at all detectable. Okay? Were it not for this, there's no other known way, even up to present day technology, where you can do any alternative robust detection. There have been several attempts going right down to the single nucleus level, atomic force, magnetic resonance microscopy, magnetic resonance force microscopy. I don't know how many of us would have heard about that. It's not AFM. It's MRFM, Magnetic Resonance Force Microscopy. But you do the resonance anyway, in order to get there, even with the force microscope. And the resonance is what we're talking about. We'll not be talking about the force microscopy part. But this is how the schematic goes and the return to equilibrium. You disturb the system from equilibrium. You cannot sustain it forever. And you want to sustain it as long as possible from the point of view of detection efficiency, but it'll go back, whether you like it or not, it'll go back to equilibrium and then you cannot see it anymore. And the return to equilibrium is a relaxation process. So you see that this is the basic thing, the equations that you can put down for the precession frequency and the precession frequency is modified, the screening or the chemical shift and the couplings. And that is the stuff of NMR for structure elucidation. There is this basic precession frequency which depends on the magnetic moment of the nucleus or the magnetogyric ratio and is directly proportional to the magnetic field intensity B0. And this product of gamma, the magnetogyric ratio of the nuclear isotope times the magnetic field intensity B0 gives rise to the precession frequency expressed as angular frequency units, radians per second. But then this gets modified. It's not just minus gamma B0, it's minus gamma B0 one minus sigma where there's a little screening of the nuclear magnetic moment from the applied external magnetic field by the surrounding electron density. And that is the gives rise to this. The screening gives rise to this chemical shift, which is all about the structure uh, property relationships which will then ensue. Okay? And it's such a high resolution technique. You can operate your NMR spectrometer at a variable field, each spectrometer will be at a fixed field, but you can have many different spectrometers at different fields. If you have the old-fashioned electromagnets, they don't take you very far in the magnetic field, but within the range, you can actually vary the magnetic field from zero to maybe the best of superconducting technology with some loss of cryofluids. It can get you up to rampable fields up to zero to six Tesla or a little bit around there. But in NMR, we don't try to do that. We just keep a fixed superconducting magnetic field. In certain areas, you might want to ramp the magnetic field, like for ESR. High field ESR uses superconducting magnets, but will ramp the superconducting field in a limited range. Okay? Now, the important point for NMR is there are these chemical shifts reflecting the electronic environment around the nucleus in the molecule, and then there are these couplings of one nucleus spin to various others in the same molecule. And that is the stuff of NMR for structure elucidation. But as I already, already mentioned, you're disturbing the equilibrium of the spin magnetic moments even to measure it. And therefore, the system will irreversibly opt to return to equilibrium with its own time constant. And this time constant of the recovery of the magnetization of the nuclear spin ensemble to its equilibrium conditions, there is, a, it, uh, there is a tale to tell there. And the tale that it tells is a tale of molecular motional correlation times and molecular motional spectral densities resulting in spin relaxation times. The spin relaxation times are captured by these simple block equations 
Uh, we'll not worry about the details. There's a block equation. The first term is a precession term, which could include the effects of chemical shifts and spin-spin couplings. And the next three terms are the relaxation terms for the X component of magnetization, the Y component, and the Z component, which is in the direction of the magnetic field. And you see the time constant for the relaxation is different in the plane that is transverse to Z. The Z relaxation time constant is different from the XY relaxation time constant. This is a classical master equation of magnetic res resonance and a semi-classical master equation of magnetic resonance treats of phenomena which are lost when you talk only about spin magnetization. Spin is known as multiple quantum coherences. Okay? Multiple quantum coherence. It's not just a simple magnetization along Z or somewhere in the XY plane, but states which are not magnetization, yet they are neither Z nor XY magnetization, is something else. They are a coherent superposition of Zeeman eigenstates. And from that is born the whole field of ensemble quantum computing by magnetic resonance. We will not talk about this today, just barely mentioning this. We are only talking about the molecular sciences being characterized by magnetic resonance, but magnetic resonance is a tool for, it's, it's an ensemble quantum computer. So magnetic resonance has turned out in the last 20 years or so to, to work as an ensemble quantum computer. In the very early days, we ourselves made some humble contributions which are patented to not genuine quantum computing, to, but to what I call as spin computing, we will not worry about the details, uh, but it was always on our back burner subsequently for various reasons because that's not bread and butter for most of us, okay? Now this is a semi-classical master equation of magnetic resonance where you capture the behavior of correlated motions of spins. Not just the uncorrelated motions of isolated spins, but the correlated motions of pairs of spins are you know, a small uh, collection of interacting spins. So the whole model up to now, up to that first equation, is isolated non-interacting spins. They don't interact with each other, except for that spin-spin coupling that I mentioned right at the end. But here, right from the word go, you are talking about interacting spins and the various multiple quantum coherences or correlated states of motion that they can exhibit by way of the density matrix description. We will not have occasion to deal with this. Just remember, however, that there is a T1 or the longitudinal relaxation time of the longitudinal magnetization of the spin ensemble and there is a T2 or the transverse magnetization time of the same spin ensemble. Okay, and these things will work. Relaxation works only when the spin ensemble is off equilibrium. If the spin ensemble is at thermal equilibrium, there's no relaxation. It is already relaxed. It is at equilibrium. And that's the point, you know, it's a sleeping giant. It tells you nothing. It just is peacefully at sleep. And you cannot even detect it, it's so weak. And that is why we disturb the equilibrium to generate an EMF at the end of the day by some means resonance and a coil detection and then whether we like it or not it will try and go back to equilibrium okay but then we find oh when it goes back to equilibrium it tells us something about molecular motions down to the picosecond levels of time scale you're talking about molecular motional correlation times which can be characterized by the measurements of the spin spin or the spin lattice relaxation time and these correlation times can be down to uh, 1 to 10 picoseconds right up to nanoseconds and higher. So we, a lot of the time we imagine that NMR is a very slow technique. It is. As far as static properties of the NMR spectrum are concerned, it is a dead slow technique. In fact, the joke goes in the medical community, yeah, NMR is great at imaging the brain. Any dead organ will do for NMR imaging. But any live throbbing organ, like a cardiac imaging and so on, is a whole different ballgame. But mind you, it has been addressed and people have done cardiac MRI. But in the early years, this was the butt of the jokes of others, you know, non-MR people, okay? There is always this banter among different communities in science and engineering and technology. And the joke about MRI was, yeah, it's very good at detecting dead brains. But actually, it is very good, I will show you, at even looking at functional brains, not to speak of cardiac imaging, okay? So, then comes the chemical shift and the couplings. 
The couplings, you might say, are the currency of spins. Chemical shifts, uh, I think I don't want to belabor the issue, but you take a simple molecule like ethanol, you have a methyl environment for the protons, you have a methylene environment for the protons, CH3 group, CH2 group, and the OH group, that's a hydroxyl environment. They each have a different electron density in their immediate environment within that functional group. And that is a primary determinant of the NMR resonance frequency or the chemical shift. The Lamar frequency, minus gamma P naught, is a major thing. On that rides the small little PPM level of modulation due to chemical shifts and couplings, okay? And this is a chemical shift, but the couplings are the currency of spins. They exchange currency notes, no? Like we exchange, and this is couplings, okay? And these are, for solution state NMR, the important couplings are through bond, indirect scalar couplings which are isotropic and then they have a fantastic behavior they reflect the dihedral angle in your molecular fragment in which these nuclear spins are embedded if you're measuring the couplings between a pair of nuclear spins they're embedded in a molecular fragment and you can find the dihedral angle in this molecular fragment gn ramachandran was the one who pioneered work on the so-called phi psi dihedral angles. He found out, worked out theoretically. He was, of course, an X-ray crystallographer. He's the one who cracked the structure of collagen and so on. But he also came up with projection reconstruction imaging. And independent of that, he came up with a phi psi plot. And that gives you the regions in the phi psi domain where peptides are energetically stable. The low energy conformational states or configurational states of peptides are captured by Ramachandran's phi and psi. And how do you measure this? NMR again. And NMR couplings. And the phi psi plot is given life. Ramachandran's theoretical phi psi plot, people give life to it by NMR measurements of couplings in small molecules, biomolecules, what have you, in the solution state, okay? So that's a very important uh, take home, okay? And there is also another kind of coupling which is particularly relevant for relaxation in solution state as well as direct couplings in solid state. And these are dipolar couplings. They are anisotropic and they average to zero. Whereas the scalar couplings are isotropic, they are not direction dependent and they have a non-zero average. The dipolar couplings are direction dependent and they average to zero when you average it over space. Nevertheless, for relaxation, it is the mean squared value of the dipolar field which matters, not just the dipolar interaction itself, but the square. You take a simple example of a sine curve. The average value, if you integrate a sine curve, you get zero. But just square it, integrate the sine squared curve. It's a non-zero integral. That's all we're talking about here. When you measure the spectrum, you're measuring the static interactions, and if that interaction has an orientation dependence which averages to zero, you don't see it, like molecules which are tumbling in solution. The dipole coupling will take all possible values because of all possible orientations of the molecule as it tumbles in the external magnetic field in your sample, okay? And then it averages to zero. But for relaxation, the same liquid sample will give rise to a dipolar coupling mechanism for the relaxation because for relaxation what matters is not the static value of the coupling or its average but the mean squared value and therefore dipolar coupling in solutions in NMR lives through the relaxation rate measurements it is already dead and gone in the spectral measurement okay so Interspin information transfer. So the whole thing is born. Uh, how do you transfer information from one spin to another? How do you know it is coupled? Well, if I can throw magnetization from one spin to a couple spin, I know they have to be coupled. Where there are no coupling, either dipolar, through space in the solid state in particular, or by and large through bond, almost without exception except for fluorine, you will have only through bond scalar couplings in solution state, which average to non-zero values. Okay, so how do you know except for these measurements? Okay, these are the measurements which give life to those uh, kinds of pictures that we have or those hypothetical reasonings that we have. With a great deal of intuition, the pioneers may have set it up, but that intuition bears fruit in real life by these measurements. Okay, and then you also have quadrupolar couplings, which is another kind of coupling for spin greater than half nuclei. But this inter-spin inter information transfer is huge. 
it gives you information about the bonding if it is information transfer through scalar couplings. It can give you information about interatomic distances if it is a dipolar coupling whose effect you are measuring through the relaxation rates. This is about the one technique which can give you interatomic distances in solution state. Okay, we will not have occasion to look at any of this in any detail. It's just an overview that I'm trying to paint for you. And Kalyan, you have to warn me, you know that when I get started, I, I will not stop unless you force me to stop. <clears throat> so there are three kinds of couplings, the scalar spin-spin couplings through bonds, the dipolar through space couplings, and the quadrupolar couplings which come into play only if the nucleus has a spin greater than half. And the dihedral angle things is shown here, the various angles phi, psi, omega, tau, and so on, and the semi-empirical kind of equations that give a relation between the coupling constant that you measure and the dihedral angle, which is at the bottom of this, and this is how the J coupling varies with the dihedral angle, okay? And this is how, from a measured dihedral, uh, measured coupling, you can infer the dihedral angle and see how well it fits into the Ramachandran plot, okay? If you're dealing with the peptides as your sample, okay? And uh, more of that with a variety of confirmations. You know, you can talk about eclipsed or staggered or uh, skew or gauche and so on. And then the same kind of uh, uh, internuclear couplings and their uh, dihedral angle dependence is shown here. We'll not worry about the details. But then comes a major point. As I already said, the number of spins in the low energy state is more typically than the number of spins in the high energy state. And this number is usually computable by assuming the Boltzmann distribution law. We will not say more about this, we'll just take it as a given that the number of spins in a given orientation, which corresponds to a given energy in an external magnetic field, is governed by this equation, where G is a degeneracy factor, which for NMR becomes one. So you can drop G, it's just one. C is a proportionality concept, you can evaluate it, okay? And this is what then emerges for the population ratio of two energy levels E2 and E1, the N2, number of particles in energy level E2 divided by the number of particles in energy level E1 is given by this Boltzmann factor, e to the minus E2 minus E1 by KT. Okay? And this is very important. This is what governs NMR spectral intensities, the population difference. And they are pathetic. They are pathetically low because the energy difference is so low as compared to KT. It is like 0.01% of KT at ordinary temperatures. That's the problem with NMR, which is why we said right about the coupling, it is the sensitivity or, I'm sorry, it is the resolution or contrast versus the sensitivity. So you have this huge bonus in resolution. In the whole test tube of a sample, you can have a better than a 0.1 ppm level resolution, down to a PPB level resolution. But, uh, and it, that translates to excellent image resolution also, except that the sensitivity is atrocious, okay? So, the Boltzmann distribution here, and if you work it out, because you define E2 as the higher energy state, you see that N2 by N1 is less than one. I don't have time to go through this, but NMR has a huge thing going about it. Is this universally true? It is not. In NMR, we can do a population inversion across just two energy levels, which is unthinkable, for example, in a laser system, but we do it all the time in a nuclear <coughs> ensemble or even in an electron spin ensemble. We'll not have the time to go into why this is so, how it is so, what does it lead to, what can you do with it, and so on. But just note this, that although the higher energy state has typically a lower population than the lower energy state, giving rise to the NMR signal intensity that is usable, but nevertheless, you can invert this and you can make the lower energy state less populated than the higher energy state under certain conditions, okay? Now, the NMR of coupled spins is what we are talking about, and because the coupling in liquids is through bonds, if you can transfer magnetization across the scalar couplings, you got evidence of the bonding between the spins. And that is how we can get at bonding. We have no X-ray diffractogram, which tells us the position of atoms. NMR is a very roundabout method of getting there, but it is a terrific, subtle tool. But for being a very subtle tool, it's very roundabout. Okay, so you, you have to pay a price. X-ray diffraction, okay, just do it. Just diffract the X-ray beams. And the software will take care of the rest. NMR, 
of course there's plenty of software but there is a, like not one or two or three standard experiments like for most of the things for nmr and magnetic resonance including esr there are like dozens if not hundreds of experiments and you will have to choose which is the one that suits meets your purposes and then there is interpretation there is software sure but then you have to interpret quite a lot of the time and that's what adds fun to this enterprise and challenges to the enterprise but they evidence bonds okay and you take a two spin half system that has four energy levels and the populations are indicated by the dots here and there are five dots in the lowest energy level and if it is two identical nuclei like two protons then these two levels level number 2 and level number 3 have equal populations let's say three particles in each and the highest one is a single particle okay so you have four energy levels for two spin half like two protons or one carbon and one proton and that is how the boltzmann distribution will lead to so you have a transition of the s spins between levels 1 and 3 you have another transition of the s spin that's the second spin i'm sorry the first spin you're talking about in the spin uh, two spin descriptor the first spin is the S spin and here is a between 2 and 4 there is a transition of the S spin it goes from alpha to beta spin with the plus half component to the minus half component orientation okay so that is a 2 4 transition and then you have similarly for the I spin that is the second spin here beta alpha to beta beta and that is the uh, 3 4 transition and you also have the 1, 2 transition between these two levels. These are the four transitions in a two spin half system. Five minutes? Okay. But then you can throw these magnetizations around. If it is a heteronuclear spin pair, you have a carbon and proton and the gamma ratios are different. The one, a gamma of a carbon is one fourth of the gamma of proton. So the populations are scaled accordingly as per the Boltzmann distribution. And you get essentially in some measure four times the sensitivity sensitivity in a proton spectra actually it is different but i'm simplifying it from the population difference point of view the proton spectrum intensity is four times that of the carbon spectral intensity and that is what is shown here for the one three and two four transitions you have one fourth the intensity as compared to the one two and three four now you can throw these things around okay supposing you did an experiment where instead of five spins here and four particles there three particles here, five and three at equilibrium, you made it four and four. You can selectively irradiate that transition and make a transfer of spin population from the energy level number one to energy level number three. This is selective population transfer. You can do that. If you do that, what happens is the three one transition, you cannot detect it anymore because there is no population difference. So you see the three one or one three transition has disappeared. And then you see the other transition of the S spin that is unchanged. The 2, 4 is as before. But then lo and behold, look at the coupled spin. These are all spin partners which are coupled, okay? I and S. And then you see that between 1 and 2, the transition intensity, instead of being 4 spins minus 3 spins now, uh, instead of 5 minus 3. So if that had 2 units of intensity, this is now 1 unit of intensity, as you see here. So the intensity is halved for this 1-2 transition and for the other transition you have an increase of intensity. So you have these correlations coming up by population transfers or coherence transfers. Please note also in these four level systems that apart from the single quantum transitions where you go from beta beta to beta alpha, so the total magnetic spin quantum number changes by one unit. Where alpha corresponds to spin plus half component beta corresponds to spin minus half component for each particle so the total spin component for the two particles is plus half plus half one here plus half minus half that is zero here and then you have minus half plus half that is zero here and minus half minus half that is minus one here but these are single quantum transitions which we have pictured however if you make a transition from level three to level two or the other way around that is a zero quantum transition it has no change in the magnetic quantum number. So is this. I have a time to show you one example of this and then we'll I'll just have to show an image and then call it quits, okay? I don't want to tax you. Uh, you mean my 55 minutes are up?
<laughs> okay, all right. By these population transfer experiments, you can generate very strange spectra. You can have spectra with negative intensities, positive intensities, zero intensities. Don't assume that negative intensities correspond to emissions or positive intensities correspond to absorptions. In NMR, the phase of a signal has no absolute significance. Only the relative phase of signals has a significance. Positive versus negative. What is negative subtly differs from positive, it's the opposite of positive. But what is positive is not necessarily emissive, what is negative is not necessarily absorptive. All of these are absorption signals, but with different phases, depending on the populations, okay? And this gives rise, this kind of population transfer experiments gives rise to the concept of multidimensional NMR, where you segment the time period into preparation, uh, evolution, mixing, and detection, and people can use a two-pulse experiment with uh, detection during that time period and repeat the experiment systematic, with systematic variation of the evolution period, build up a whole series of signals and Fourier transform them according to each time variable. The acquisition time variable as well as the detection time variable, uh, sorry, acquisition or detection time variable as well as the evolution time variable. You Fourier transform with respect to each of these time variables, you get two spectral dimensions, which are the F2 dimension and the F1 dimension. And typically, the F2 is plotted horizontally, and this is the acquisition dimension, while the F1 is the evolution dimension that is plotted vertically. And now you see, if you take a simple molecule with three coupled spins like 2,3-dibromopropionic acid, your normal proton NMR spectrum will look like that. You have chemical shifts for the X spin, different from the M and different from the A. But then instead of one chemically shifted line, you have a whole multiplet of four lines with one overlapping line somewhere, maybe. But then, this is due to coupling. And to prove that, you do such an experiment, 2D correlation experiment correlation spectroscopy, and then you see your multiplets, instead of being a, line, a set of four lines, becomes four lines in each dimension, so it's four by four. So you get 16 lines in a multiplet of this kind. It looks like you're complicating life, but actually you are throwing direct in, directly into evidence the couplings, okay? And here what we have shown is with unresolved couplings, we can get the best of both worlds. We can show the spin coupling, this is our own work, we can show the spin coupling, although it is not resolved. And thereby, we can, in, we can infer the molecular bonding topology. And this becomes useful, for example, in a deuterated species. You can look at deuterium-deuterium couplings are 42.5 times smaller than the corresponding proton-proton couplings because scalar couplings scale with gamma squared. So do dipolar couplings, but here we're talking about scalar couplings, okay? And here we see on the deuterium, you take a sample like pyridine, okay? This is shown here, uh, per deuterated pyridine. It has just got three chemical shifts for the ortho deuteron, uh, one chemical shift there for the meta deuterons, and I'm sorry, for the two ortho deuterons, so the two meta deuterons and the para. And you see the completely unresolved couplings, the coupling constants in the protons are going to be an average value with the dihedral angle dependence, they will range between 4 and 12 hertz. The average value, you might say, is about 7. It will also change with the number of intervening bonds. But you see the couplings here? They are far less than the line width. So you can never resolve these lines. But we could show that we can make an excellent correlation spectrum with a relayed correlation even, with excellent signal-to-noise ratio across deuterium unresolved couplings. But you don't have to take it on faith. You can actually amplify these couplings this is a multiple quantum experiment on the unresolved coupling uh, matrix of a deuterated system, the same system as before. Not to worry about these details, but you see we have then come up with an experiment. We recognize that there's a special kind of a double quantum transition which gives you a four-fold splitting as compared to the normal spectrum. So if you have a coupling like 0 0.3 hertz and the deuterium Deuterium coupling is 0 0.3 hertz, the deuterium line width is 1 hertz, so there's no way you can resolve it unless you use a high uh, resolution filter and thereby degrade the signal noise ratio and even then you end up for your pains with an artifact peak and with a minor suggestion of a coupling. In our experiment of a one spin double quantum, you see, there is a coupling which is amplified by a factor of four, and one spin double quantum coherence is a longer T2, and therefore I get an effective resolution enhancement by a factor of 6.67, and you can resolve this coupling down to the baseline, you can measure it. 
And this has been used by other chemists for cluster size determination and organolithium chemistry. This is an experiment which came from our lab. And this is an experiment in gels. Because in MRS, you don't have resolved couplings. The line width is not typically less than 7 hertz, if at best. And the couplings are never more than 7 hertz, at best. So you will never resolve couplings. And so we did this for proton NMR also. It's not just for deuterium or lithium-6, it's also for protons. And you see here that the zero quantum, uh, I'm sorry, the single quantum transition gives rise to, this is a, a, spec, a molecule which I have mapped here, taurine. And it's a CH2, CH2 system, A2X2, and you get two triplets in solution state. And in a gel, you just see two unresolved chemically shifted lines. But you take our zero quantum spectrum, which we call a zealous, and you get how much here? 6J is the splitting between these two lines, because each of them is occurring at plus or minus 3J. And that is what a spin evolution under spin lock or isotropic mixing can do. So we call this zero and multiple quantum evolution under spin lock, zealous. Zero and uh, m m multiple quantum evolution under spin lock. We can do this in solids. I won't worry you about that. I'll just give one uh, example. And there's this Trozzi experiment from the group of Kurt Wittrich, who was able to show that we can use, in spite of the poor line widths as the molecular weight increases for the system in solution state, they were able to show that due to some very peculiar interference effects in relaxation, due to interference between different relaxation mechanisms, a doublet of two lines can have different line widths. One which is sharper than the normal line and one which is broader. And you can pick and choose. You do a selection of the sharper line and you can you can gain that information here, you see? So this is a nitrogen proton coupling. One axis is the N15, the horizontal axis, the vertical axis is uh, probably the proton I've not marked here. And you see that from the transverse relaxation optimized experiment, you can get sharp single peaks where there are broad doublets normally, okay? This is because the dipolar relaxation mechanism interferes with the chemical shift anisotropy relaxation mechanism, and it gives rise to differential line broadening of the two doublet components of the spin coupled uh, scenario. And there is other things, how do you increase the sensitivity of detection of rare spins? We will not talk about it. We have our own patented methods for doing rare spin connectivity mapping across double quantum uh, coherences, which have uh, uh, 40 percent higher sensitivity or uh, uh, time savings by a factor of two. We will not worry you about that. Carbon, carbon correlations. Complete suppression of the diagonal peaks of a cozy for rare spins, okay? And then indirect detected version, which we call as high class. The direct carbon experiment for carbon-carbon couplings is class C. Carbon, low abundance, single transition, correlation spectroscopy. High class is done with the proton detection on such systems. And once again, you see, we are better than the best known until then. This is the standard methods of Griesinger, Christian Griesinger, adequate experiment, Otting's experiment, and this is a simple sample of 2,3 uh, dilabeled alanine, and you see the uh, methyl doublet due to the coupling with the CH proton, and we select a single transition. Obviously, the signal noise is enhanced. We have two alternative methods is the best, but it's technically slightly more challenging, so we have a compromise. But each case is better than the uh, uh, up, up, uh, whatever was known up to that point of time from Griesinger's group and Otting's group, okay? And this is the corresponding uh, methylene proton signal in the same molecule. The quartet is now simplified to uh, two lines which are separated by twice the coupling. The normal quartet, each line in the quartet is separated by the coupling. Here, the quartet is simplified two lines but two lines go missing, and then the separation is twice the normal separation, okay? So we can do this, and uh, laxometry for halogen bonding, I will skip this, because laxation times can be used to infer molecular motional correlation times. And if you've got a complex formation, this complex is going to tumble more slowly than the uncomplex species. And by a careful measurement, especially at low fields, this becomes very useful. It's a direct measure of motional correlation time. Low fields have much going against them. Very poor sensitivity, 
of detection because sensitivity scales is the three halves power of the magnetic field intensity in high resolution NMR. In imaging, it can be anywhere between linear scaling to quadratic scaling. In high resolution NMR, is typically three halves power loss scaling with the magnetic field for the sensitivity. So low fields means low sensitivity, but you gain so much more. So again, you know, it's a trade-off. What you gain in the swings, you lose in the roundabouts. At the cost of sensitivity, we can make direct measurements at low field for the molecular tumbling or correlation times. We can infer the free molecule as compared to the uh, complex molecule. Is it complex one to one or is it complex one to two? All of that can be inferred from these measurements. Using a simple relaxation model, you can use more elaborate things. I've just shown you the simplest equations here. We'll not worry about that. But you see the rotational correlation times when we use DAPCO as our base and the uh, 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 PFIB, pentafluoroiodobenzene for the halogen bonding. The iodine introduces the halogen bonding motif, okay? And then you see uh, the correlation times goes all the way from about 15 uh, picoseconds to about 45 picoseconds. That shows the one is to two complex, okay? Putting it in very simple terms. Uh, borrowing sensitivity, I'll not talk about this now. Uh, by adding a free radical to your sample, you can do some double irradiation of the electron spin resonance and the NMR, and you can take 100-fold or 1,000-fold enhancement of sensitivity at some loss of resolution for your NMR, okay? I'll not talk about this. This is also work from our lab. We showed that we can do sensitivity-enhanced DNP of soft matter in the Overhauser mode at even 13.5 megahertz. And uh, you can put in place a diagonal suppressed homonuclear correlation experiment with sensitivity enhancement. So I'll not bother you with the details of that, but we have done all that, okay? And you can also do it for heteronuclear case. Just this last example of imaging, and I'm done, okay? This is what you can get from a head image. This is not from our lab. This is from the Siemens MRI Atlas. The internal structure of a brain, until MRI came along really, was from cadaver dissection. Okay, so the famous anatomy books, Gray's Anatomy, for example, there are even television serials going by that name, Gray's Anatomy. These were typically based on cadaver dissection photographs. But MRI, you can get this, as I said, the joke against MRI is that it's very good at imaging dead brains, okay? But not only that. Huh? So we can get all the structure, and the structures are identified, but I'm not a medical person. Those of you who have got good enough eyesight to read this fine print and also sufficiently interested, the biology group maybe, you might find this interesting, that all these structures in the brain can be unequivocally identified by a straightforward MRI image. And this has been deliberately shown in the coronal view. The typical image which you will get from an X-ray radiograph is essentially a transverse or an axial view. If the CAT scan, you can play around by about plus or minus 20 degrees with respect to the transverse or the axial. But here, uh, the angle of view is arbitrary. It's up to you. You can take a transverse view, a coronal view, a sagittal view, an oblique view. The heart is in an oblique plane. So it is jolly good that you can make an oblique view. And that is done for cardiac imaging. And one other thing is the functional MRI. As the brain functions, as I speak, which part of my brains are uh, active? As you listen and uh, think about it and have ideas, or you sleep through, which other parts of the brain are active? Unfortunately, I cannot sleep through my talk. Okay, So I have not managed to do the sleepwalking, I've heard of, but sleep talking, with some reasonable science being <laughs> projected, I'm not aware, okay? But you can do that. So it's not just a dead brain. Eh? You can differentiate the regions of the brain which are active in mother tongue uh, speech and in second language speech, which was acquired uh, at a grown-up period in primary school, for example. Different areas of the brain come up when there is a bilingual home where the mother and father speak two languages and the child in infancy picks up both these languages. It has two mother tongues. It, uh, it uses a particular areas of the brain. But the same child, if it does not acquire two languages in infancy, but acquires a second language in primary school, then a different area of the brain comes into play for the second language. It's, uh, it's amazing, and you can, you, can, you can map all this. The colors are computer generated, but it is a contrast due to the T1, and in this case, the T2. This is functional MRI, and this is the both blood oxygen level dependent contrast, okay? And our own examples of fuel cell imaging, 
I'll not bother you about that, but here we have made images of fuel cells in situ under load. And when we did this a few years ago, we were among the two groups internationally who were able to do it. And then in collaboration with the German and British group, I'm not giving you the details because Kalyan will lynch me and then my wife will be unhappy if I don't turn up, so I'm going to wind this. And the final thing is the work done in collaboration with uh, uh, British and German uh, scientists, German physicists and British botanists. And we came up with a pulse sequence for carbon-13 imaging indirectly detected through the scalar couplings to protons because proton imaging is ever so much higher in sensitivity and in image resolution. So this is the kind of games that you can play with NMR. And you see we have a plant, a cast of bean seedling in, the, uh, seedling in the NMR probe. We dip it in a source of uh, uh, hexose sugars, which are its nutrients because we have stripped the cartilagin of its endosperm, but its food is through the hexose sugar bath that we give. And then you see, uh, that's what is shown here. The cartilagin stripped of the endoderm are dipping into this bath of sugar solution. And you see the water image transverse view. We not cut the plant, the seedling is intact. It has been hydroponically grown for about six days in the dark and then it is put in the NMR probe. It is aerated from the bottom, it is alive. And we are not cut it, we are not dissected it, nothing. Imaging is about non-destructive, non-invasive also most of the time. Sometimes people use contrast agents. It is not usually necessary but radiologists may like to build their <laughs> patients and then they would charge you for a contrast agent anyway. But this is without any external agent being administered. The xylem phloem system embedded in the cortical tissue of a plant horizontal cross section, water image. This is just the water, any living organism, at least 70% of it is water. And that's what is used for MRI, default. Whether it is a brain or anything else. And in our um, fuel cell image also, it is the water that we are mapping. But here it is the C2 position of fructose that we are selectively mapping from a sucrose molecule. So the chemical shift of the C2 position of fructose differs from the chemical shift of the C2 position of the fructose ring in sucrose. And we take that as a handle and we specifically selectively image the C2 position of the fructose ring in sucrose and that is shown in a time dependent map and you see that initially there is nothing showing up because the system has not been fed sucrose. The system has been fed a mixture of glucose and fructose. It synthesizes sucrose. This little seedling whose endosperm has been stripped away is still smart enough in the dark it synthesizes sucrose. There is no photosynthesis here. And as it is synthesized, it is traveling down the xylem phloem system, the hypocortical region, which is where we do our NMR detection. I showed that the, with the coil being wrapped in the hypocortical region uh, yeah, in one of those figures. Okay, not to worry. It's uh, going too fast and gets stuck. Yeah, you see, that's where the coil is, the hypocortical region. Okay, and uh, the, the nutrients, uh, the sucrose is synthesized here when this thing is dipping in the bath and then it travels down the hypocortical region and we detect it when it has reached this point. So it is a kinetic process we are monitoring. What is the rate of transport? We can measure the rate of transport. Here we are just showing you those pictures uh, at zero time after insertion into the hexose bath at 2.5 hours and so on, right up to about 16.5 hours when you have reached the steady state. But you see what is important is in the cortex parenchyma, the sucrose is never downloaded. It is only in the uh, peripheral parenchyma that it is downloaded. In the pith parenchyma, sorry. It is in the pith parenchyma, it is never downloaded. It is dark. The bright regions here are the sucrose. The higher the concentration of sucrose you're detecting, the brighter the image in that part of the region. Okay? And that is how MRI works. Basically, there is contrast due to T1 or due to T2. The relaxation times of the primary contrast is how many protons are you detecting. Okay, and this is like here the primary contrast mechanism, it is not T1 or T2, and here you see that the pith parenchyma, okay, never gets any sucrose downloaded from the hypocortical region or in the stem. It is all going into the cortex parenchyma, not into the pith parenchyma. That is what the dark region in the center of the donut shows. 
no sucrose there. But in the cortex, there is gathering concentration of the sucrose as time progresses. Then we made a faster echo planar imaging version of this with my pulse sequences, uh, pulse rotating frame transfer sequences with windows and with a specific method of getting rid of the heteronuclear couplings and we could gain an imaging speed. Those images were obtained with 90 minute time frames. Each image took about 90 minutes. That's not very fast. But here we have it in about 13 to 14 minutes. So a factor of 6 to 7 speeding up of the uh, image. Okay. This is the previous image, the so-called spin echo. This is the gradient echo, echo planar image with our special decoupling technique. Uh, you have to use a different decoupling technique for the spin echo imaging as compared to the gradient echo imaging. And this uh, is a cause for concern pe when people don't understand how couplings work. But for us who come from the high resolution world, this is bread and butter, okay? And then here is a water image. So you can see what the kind of information you can retrieve. And I will stop here. There are volume localized spectroscopy, fruit ripening under natural and artificial conditions. And the way in a dead rat, we did a two dimensional experiment of the accumulation of lactate in a specific region of the brain. Because in a one day experiment, the chemical shifts in MRI are very small in their frequency separation because MRI is done at low magnetic fields. Even today, the FDA has not allowed magnetic fields more than three Tesla. In NMR, people are going up to 1,200 uh, megahertz, which is like, what is it, like 24 uh, or more uh, Tesla. I mean, uh, it, it will be like 28 Tesla actually, right? 28 Tesla. But here, FDA doesn't permit you to go beyond three Tesla. The chemical separation scales with the magnetic field strength. And therefore, you got a three Tesla, less than one ninth of the frequency separation you might have at 28 Tesla, okay? And then it becomes useful. You get resonance from lactate and from threonine, for example, which are very close. And the line widths are six or seven or 10 hertz. This is not like high resolution NMR in MRS. And how do you distinguish them? Well, we came up with this two-dimensional zero quantum correlation experiment where you see the telltale lactate peaks which come at the chemical shift difference. And this threonine cannot produce in a million years. It's only lactate which can produce this 2.3 ppm chemical shift difference between the methyl and the uh, CH protons of lactate. Okay? And that's not possible in the threonine. Okay? The spectrometer looks like this. Uh, in my former laboratory, um, which uh, is running under uh, charge of another f different faculty now, who is an ultrasonics man. This is the electronics and this is the magnet. And uh, this is the magnet alone. And here you see the electronics of the larger one for animal imaging, and that's the magnet there. This is almost like a human MRI, but the human MRI scanner would have a diameter of 60, 65, 70 centimeters. Here we are talking about 40 centimeters, okay? That's the MRI scanner we have. And at the very last, I would like to skip the prospects. The prospects are unending with NMR. Every 10, 15 years, we imagine that, okay, the game is over, game is up. But no, something else comes along. So Kalyan will tell you more about it, but I'd just like to recall the words of Goudsmith, who inferred from atomic spectra that must be some intrinsic angular momentum, having missed the Stern experiment and everybody having misinterpreted it, Goldsmith was still clever enough to infer from atomic spectra the presence of the spin. And he said, I want to say one more thing. Even if you make a minor contribution, even if it is not important, even then still it gives you an enormous satisfaction. And therefore, Gaussman says, I do believe that one should not always aspire to tackle only what is most important. You should, but not exclusively necessarily. You try to uh, uh, explore a mix of things in my humble view, where you get fun part-wise, and part-wise you get the fruits of the uh, labor in terms of uh, meritorious uh, weighty applications, okay? Therefore, I do believe, God says, as one should not always aspire to tackle only what is most important, but try to have fun working in science and obtain results. I need to acknowledge a lot of people, Dr. Christy George, uh, Ramesh, uh, Ram Muthi was involved in an early part of the work in uh, deuterium isotropic mixing, very early part. Ayal Sami Ramamurthy, I think he's in the United States. This lady is also in the United States currently. And then uh, my German collaborators for the organolithium stuff, Mons Hills, Von Phelps, and Günther, and the classy experiment from Ramesh and Christy George, the high class experiment from um, Christy George again, and the diagonal suppressed 
homonuclear 2D correlations, which we call as dissect, diagonal suppressed pinnacle correlation spectroscopy, and various versions of that uh, at the hands of Christy George with the DNP and with the TOXI, and at the hands of Abhishek Banerjee for the exchange spectroscopy, for the volume localized spectroscopy, and the ultrafast spectroscopy. And then some overhaus at DNP, which I didn't talk about, and also some overhaus at DNP imaging. And the rad brain work was done with Merbolt, Gingel, and Fram in Göttingen many, many, many years ago, almost 30 years ago, more years than I care to remember. And then uh, polymer and plant uh, imaging with uh, Apostola Spiros and Hudson and Kirkenberger, Heidenreich, Kimmich and Bortel. EPR imaging, I didn't show you this. And fuel cell imaging with Christy George and a bunch of fuel cell researchers, Jalajachi, Sahu, Sridhar, Pichmani and uh, Shukla. And I need to uh, thank CSIR headquarters as well as CSIR CLRI where I worked. And then DRDO for funding of my microimaging project where I worked at CSIR CLRI and then DST and ACRB and IIT Madras for my subsequent career at IIT Madras. Thank you very much. I deeply appreciate your patience. For, forgive me for the extra time that I've taken. Thank you so much.